Hey everyone, this is Alan Shim. Uh, welcome to this introductory video on pulmonary pocus, where you'll learn how to look for things like pneumothorax, pleural effusion, and pulmonary edema. I'm excited, let's get started. You already knew that pocus is awesome. Well, it's extra awesome when assessing for pulmonary causes of dyspnea. It's fast, relatively easy to perform, and accurate. So for instance, in detecting pneumothorax, it is hands down a better tool than even a chest x-ray with higher sensitivity and high specificity. By the way, you will see QR codes that will link to the studies that I cite. For pulmonary edema, POCUS is equally as accurate. Here are two meta-analyses. The first compares POCUS with chest radiography and the other meta-analysis compares to a clinical standard for pulmonary edema. The key advantage of POCUS is that you can make the diagnosis at the bedside without having to wait for a chest radiograph. In addition, studies have shown nearly instantaneous improvement or resolution on POCUS uh, when treatment is initiated, and this is often delayed with serum biomarkers and other forms of imaging. This is the same story for detection of pleural effusions. POCUS is highly accurate and is even considered a gold standard or reference standard in some of these studies uh, looking at chest radiograph. Now, I won't discuss the evidence behind some of our physical exam findings because it is important to integrate the history and physical exam with the POCUS. However, often there is a trade-off between high sensitivity and low specificity or high specificity and low sensitivity, uh, as you see here with rails and orthopnea. The question is, do I always perform lung POCUS? The answer, and probably surprising to some of you, is no. This diagram describes how I usually approach patients presenting with dyspnea. It may seem a little complicated, but there are three main points. First, a careful history will often reveal the diagnosis. And often patients present with a, a high likelihood of a disease or a process. So for instance, someone with a history of asthma presenting with their usual presentation, and the key here is that you want to elicit how exact the presentation is compared to prior, or if it differs, how that changes your clinical reasoning. But if the presentation is very, very similar to prior episodes, that probably is the diagnosis. And I'll confirm it with wheezing or, or prolonged expiratory phase on my physical exam. I don't really need POCUS for presentations like this. Now there are presentations that are unclear or um, you don't really think it's pulmonary in nature, and cardiac ischemia is a very, very common cause of dyspnea. And so for this reason, I'll often get a screening EKG right off the bat. Another broad category of non-pulmonary causes of dyspnea are the metabolic acidoses that come with respiratory compensation. These, along with other non-pulmonary causes of dyspnea, will often require further investigation via serum tests or additional imaging. However, very commonly, the etiology of dyspnea is pulmonary or cardiopulmonary, and this is where POCUS can be very valuable. Here are some POCUS profiles and patterns that you will begin to know uh, starting now, and you'll start to really develop as you progress in your training. Now, we're not really going to actually di discuss the interpretation on the caveats. This is just a quick reference, and there are links at the end to some of this discussion. This is an intercostal space where you have the pleural interface where the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura meet. The visceral pleura, which is wrapped around the lung, slides against the parietal pleura, which is connected to the hemithorax. And this happens during the respiratory cycle. So this movement is what you are able to visualize on POCUS. In a pneumothorax, the two layers are no longer sliding against each other, but are separated by this layer of air. The sound waves are not able to image the visceral pleura because of this layer of air, so there's no apparent sliding. By the way, air is usually mobile so that it will be anterior when the patient is supine, but it will actually be more apical when the patient is upright. Chest x-rays will condense everything into one single image, and that's why supine chest x-rays can miss pneumothoraces since the lung and anterior air layer are all sandwiched into this one image. However, with POCUS, we're actually able to focus on this pleural sliding, or absence of that, 
in the same areas where we expect a pneumothorax. On the left, there is normal pleural sliding, where you can see this movement right here. Some people describe this as ants walking on a log. On the right, you could tell that there is no pleural sliding, and this is highly suggestive of a pneumothorax. First, we want to use a high-frequency linear probe, and we want to put it on lung presets. We'll usually start in the mid-clavicular line, around the 5th to 9th intercostal space, with the indicator dot pointed towards the clavicle. And we want to assess the pleural line along a few intercostal spaces, so we'll slide the probe superiorly to look at this, kind of like this. You'll see multiple pleural interfaces interspersed between ribs. And you also want to make this assessment on both sides. Anisotropy is a really important concept. You really need a sharp pleural interface to best visualize sliding. The best way to do this is to fan or tilt the probe like this, and what you'll see is that the pleural interface becomes blurry and sharp. When it's really sharp, that means that the ultrasound beam is actually hitting this pleural lining, at, um, and everything's echoing back, so you have a nice, sharp, bright image. When you're even a few degrees off axis, the image becomes blurry and darker. So you'll want to find the sharp interface by fanning. Remember for pneumothorax, you really want to just focus on this pleural interface. So if you have a lot of depth, you can decrease it so that it's really at the center of the screen. You can also decrease the gain so that you're just trained on this pleural interface. And here you can see much better sliding by just decreasing the, the gain. M-mode is another technique to help assess for pleural sliding. It's basically a plot of one line on the 2D image over time which is expressed on the x-axis. And this really dramatically increases temporal resolution. So here's the pleural interface, and here's that M-mode line. And if you engage M-mode, this is what you see. This is that pleural interface, and everything above the pleural interface, the soft tissue, is static, so there's no movement, and so you see these horizontal lines. Now everything below this pleural interface is actually moving, and so this is why there's this granular appearance, almost sandy in appearance, um, below this pleural interface. This is why a normal M-mode pattern for pleural sliding is described as sky, ocean, beach. The sky is really just kind of like the intercostal muscles, the pec muscles. The ocean itself is um, more or less the, the pleural interface here, this bright white line and it's basically like the, the crest of the wave. And then below that is the, the movement, um, which looks like, like the sand on the beach. Now, in a pneumothorax, there is no apparent movement below the pleural interface, so everything looks like a horizontal line. And this is why this is referred to as the barcode or stratosphere sign. First, let's talk about reverberation artifact in lung focus. The sound waves will travel essentially to the pleural interface and then back. Remember that most of this is air, so the sound waves don't really do well in, in this air. And so the first echo that comes back is translated as this image right here. Some of these echoes will actually bounce back from the probe back to this pleural interface again and then return again to the probe. This second set of echoes are identical to the first set. However, they took twice as long to return to the probe, so the machine interprets it as twice as deep. And so you have this happening several times, and each successive time that this happens, you generate this horizontal line. And because of attenuation, it becomes darker and darker. So these are A lines. The important thing to remember about A lines is that they are seen in normal lung but they don't give you any additional information as to the presence or absence of pneumothorax or pulmonary edema. Just as air rises in pneumothorax, fluid will settle. This is why you want to image more laterally to look for pulmonary edema, which is fluid in the lung parenchyma itself. In addition, we'll need to use a low frequency probe like this, and we'll need to adjust our depth to image around five to 10 centimeters. And often it helps to get the patient to raise their arm, usually above their head, so that you have access to the space. 
and you'll also want to fan or tilt to maximize your anisotropy. Whether cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, pulmonary edema usually starts off as interstitial fluid before flooding the alveoli. It's this fluid that is detected by the ultrasound beams here, and the beams usually sort of vibrate and ricochet off of this interstitial space that is surrounded by the adjacent air-filled lung. This creates a, a comet tail artifact, which is seen as vertical lines, like kind of like this, that emanate from the pleural interface all the way down. We call these B lines, and if there are three or more of these B lines seen in both lungs, this is highly suggestive of pulmonary edema, of which heart failure is the most common cause. Pleural fusions are outside of the lung and in the hemithorax itself. They will also layer posteriorly, so we'll stick with a low frequency probe and aim a bit more inferiorly to image this diaphragm right here. We'll want to make sure we have enough depth to image the vertebral column as well. Why? Because the air in the lung will prevent the sound waves from hitting the vertebral column above the diaphragm here. So the ultrasound image shows no continuation of the vertebral column above the diaphragm, and instead it kind of meets the, the diaphragm here. Now, in pleural fusions, the sound waves are able actually to travel through this pleural fluid to the vertebral column and return back to the probe. And this is why you can see the spine sign or spine column crossing the diaphragm. So it is key to visualize the diaphragm in the assessment of pleural fusion. This is why the probe should be a bit inferior along the costal margin, usually that's a good start, and in the mid or posterior axillary line, seen here as these two lines here. The indicator dot should also be pointed to the head or the same shoulder. You can often kind of like angle or rock the probe so you could see more of the diaphragm. And this is that vertebral column right here. Here in the normal video, notice that the spine appears to be erased. Uh, here, when the patient inhales, this is due to that air in the lung or the hemithorax preventing transmission of sound waves to the spine above the diaphragm. Now in the pleural fusion, you can see the spine continuing above the diaphragm here. And this is a spine sign which is highly sensitive and specific for pleural fusions. Here's a bonus, pneumonia. So I usually don't go looking for pneumonia in POCUS. The reason is that there's a lot of territory to scan in an adult, but this may actually be advantageous in kids where there's less territory and you want to avoid radiation if possible. However, often pneumonias are peripheral and more basilar, so you'll probably see them from time to time when looking for pulmonary edema or pleural effusion. They will be fluid-filled consolidations of the lung, so they'll almost look similar to liver, like kind of like here and here, this is why we call this hepatization of lung. Instead of portal or hepatic veins though, you'll see the bronchial tree, and some of these will contain both air or fluid. Kind of like right here, you can see that, that, that mobile uh, air bubbles and fluid. And this is similar to the air bronchogram finding seen in some pneumonias on chest radiograph. So in summary, POCUS is great at finding some common pulmonary and thoracic pathologies for dyspnea. It is fast, accurate, and can help your, in your clinical reasoning. Often you can combine that with uh, a measure of central venous pressure like the internal juggler or inferior vena cava, as well as uh, your focus echo findings. However, you should think about non-pulmonary causes of dyspnea, especially when the history doesn't fit or the POCUS appears normal. And in presentations that, based on your history and physical exam, strongly suggest an etiology, POCUS can often be deferred or only just to confirm the etiology. Thank you for watching this video. Uh, like, comment, or let me know in person what you think. Also, here are some links to suggested readings.